Captain Boldheart and the Latin Grammar Master, a holiday romance from the pen of Lieutenant Colonel Robin Redforth, aged nine, by Charles Dickens. Read by Linda Siano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Forward. The story contained herein was written by Charles Dickens in 1867. It is the third of four stories entitled Holiday Romance, and was published originally in a children's magazine in America. It purports to be written by a child aged nine. It was republished in England in All the Year Round in 1868. For this, and four other Christmas pieces, Dickens received one thousand pounds. Holiday Romance was published in book form by Messrs. Chapman and Hall in 1874 with Edwin Drood and other stories. For this reprint, the text of the story as it appeared in all the year round has been followed. Captain Boldheart and the Latin Grammar Master The subject of our present narrative would appear to have devoted himself to the pirate profession at a comparatively early age. We find him in command of a splendid schooner of one hundred guns, loaded to the muzzle, ere yet he had had a party in honor of his tenth birthday. It seems that our hero, considering himself spited by a Latin grammar master, demanded the satisfaction due from one man of honor to another. Not getting it, he privately withdrew his haughty spirit from such low company, bought a second-hand pocket pistol, folded up some sandwiches in a paper bag, made a bottle of Spanish licorice water, and entered on a career of valor. It were tedious to follow Boldheart, for such was his name, through the commencing stages of his history. Suffice it that we find him bearing the rank of Captain Boldheart, reclining in full uniform on a crimson hearthrug spread out upon the quarter-deck of his schooner The Beauty in the China Seas. It was a lovely evening, and as his crew lay grouped about him, he favored them with the following melody. O oh, landsmen are folly, O oh, pirates are jolly, O oh, diddle-dee-dum dolly, O oh, dee heave yo. The soothing effect of these animated sounds floating over the waters as the common sailors united their rough voices to take up the rich tones of Boldheart may be more easily conceived than described. It was under these circumstances that the lookout at the masthead gave the word, Whales! All was now activity. Where away? cried Captain Boldheart, starting up. On the larboard bow, sir, replied the fellow at the masthead, touching his hat. For such was the height of discipline on board the beauty that even at that height he was obliged to mind it, or be shot through the head. "'This adventure belongs to me,' said Boldheart. "'Boy, my harpoon, let no man follow.' And, leaping alone into his boat, the captain rowed with admirable dexterity in the direction of the monster. All was now excitement. "'He nears him!' said an elderly seaman, following the captain through his spy-glass. "'He strikes him!' said another seaman, a mere stripling, but also with a spy-glass. "'He tows him towards us!' said another seaman, a man in the full vigour of life, but also with a spy-glass. In fact, the captain was seen approaching, with the huge bulk following, we will not dwell on the deafening cries of Boldheart, Boldheart, with which he was received, when, carelessly leaping on the quarter-deck, he presented his prize to his men. 
they afterwards made two thousand four hundred and seventeen pound ten and sixpence by it ordering the sails to be braced up the captain now stood west northwest the beauty flew rather than floated over the dark blue waters nothing particular occurred for a fortnight except taking with considerable slaughter four spanish galleons and a snow from south america all richly laden inaction began to tell upon the spirits of the men captain boldheart called all hands aft and said my lads i hear there are discontented ones among ye let any such stand forth after some murmuring in which the expressions ay ay sir union jack avast starboard port bowsprit and similar indications of a mutinous undercurrent though subdued were audible bill boozy captain of the foretop came out from the rest his form was that of a giant but he quailed under the captain's eye what are your wrongs said the captain why do you see captain boldheart replied the towering mariner i've sailed man and boy for many a year but i never yet knowed the milk served out for the ship's company's tea to be so sour as tis aboard this craft at this moment the thrilling cry man overboard announced to the astonished crew that boozy in stepping back as the captain in mere thoughtfulness laid his hand upon the faithful pocket pistol which he wore in his belt had lost his balance and was struggling with the foaming tide all was now stupefaction but with captain boldheart to throw off his uniform coat regardless of the various rich orders with which it was decorated and to plunge into the sea after the drowning giant was the work of a moment maddening was the excitement when boats were lowered intense the joy when the captain was seen holding up the drowning man with his teeth deafening the cheering when both were restored to the main deck of the beauty and from the instant of his changing his wet clothes for dry ones captain boldheart had no such devoted though humble friend as william boozy boldheart now pointed to the horizon and called the attention of his crew to the taper spars of a ship lying snug in harbor under the guns of a fort she shall be ours at sunrise said he serve out a double allowance of grog and prepare for action all was now preparation when morning dawned after a sleepless night it was seen that the stranger was crowding on all sail to come out of the harbor and offer battle as the two ships came nearer to each other the stranger fired a gun and hoisted roman colors boldheart then perceived her to be the latin grammar master's bark such indeed she was and had been tacking about the world in unavailing pursuit from the time of his first taking to a roving life boldheart now addressed his men promising to blow them up if he should feel convinced that their reputation required it and giving orders that the latin grammar master should be taken alive he then dismissed them to their quarters and the fight began with a broadside from the beauty she then veered round and poured in another the scorpion so was the bark of the latin grammar master appropriately called was not slow to return her fire and a terrific cannonading ensued in which the guns of the beauty did tremendous execution the latin grammar master was seen upon the poop in the midst of the smoke and fire encouraging his men to do him justice he was no craven though his white hat his short gray trousers and his long snuff-colored surtout reaching to his heels 
the self-same coat in which he had spited Boldheart, contrasted most unfavorably with the brilliant uniform of the latter. At this moment, Boldheart, seizing a pike and putting himself at the head of his men, gave the word to board. A desperate conflict ensued in the hammock nettings, or somewhere in about that direction, until the Latin grammar master, having all his masts gone, his hull and rigging shot through and through, and, seeing Boldheart slashing a path towards him, hauled down his flag himself, gave up his sword to Boldheart, and asked for quarter. Scarce had he been put into the captain's boat ere the scorpion went down with all on board. On Captain Boldheart's now assembling his men, a circumstance occurred. He found it necessary, with one blow of his cutlass, to kill the cook, who, having lost his brother in the late action, was making at the Latin grammar-master in an infuriated state, intent on his destruction with a carving-knife. Captain Boldheart then turned to the Latin grammar-master, severely reproaching him with his perfidy, and put it to his crew what they considered that a master who spited a boy deserved. They answered with one voice, DEATH! It may be so, said the captain, but it shall never be said that Boldheart stained his hour of triumph with the blood of his enemy. Prepare the cutter! The cutter was immediately prepared. Without taking your life, said the captain, I must yet for ever deprive you of the power of spiting other boys. I shall turn you adrift in this boat. You will find in her two oars, a compass, a bottle of rum, a small cask of water, a piece of pork, a bag of biscuit, and my Latin grammar. Go and spite the natives, if you can find any. Deeply conscious of this bitter sarcasm, the unhappy wretch was put into the cutter, and was soon left far behind. He made no effort to row, but was seen lying on his back with his legs up when last made out by the ship's telescopes. A stiff breeze now beginning to blow, Captain Boldheart gave orders to keep her south-southwest, easing her a little during the night by falling off a point or two west by west, or even by west-south, if she complained much. He then retired for the night, having in truth much need of repose. In addition to the fatigues he had undergone, this brave officer had received sixteen wounds in the engagement but had not mentioned it. In the morning a white squall came on, and was succeeded by other squalls of various colors. It thundered and lightninged heavily for six weeks. Hurricanes then set in for two months. Waterspouts and tornadoes followed. The oldest sailor on board, and he was a very old one, had never seen such weather. The beauty lost all idea where she was, and the carpenter reported six feet two of water in the hold. Everybody fell senseless at the pumps every day. Provisions now ran very low. Our hero put the crew on short allowance, and put himself on shorter allowance than any man in the ship. But his spirit kept him fat. In this extremity, the gratitude of Boozy, the captain of the foretop whom our readers may remember, was truly affecting. The loving though lowly William repeatedly requested to be killed and preserved for the captain's table. We now approach a change in affairs. One day, during a gleam of sunshine and when the weather had moderated, the man at the masthead too weak now to touch his hat, besides its having been blown away, called out, Savages! All was now expectation. 
Presently, fifteen hundred canoes, each paddled by twenty savages, were seen advancing in excellent order. They were a light green color, the savages were, and sang with great energy the following strain. Choo-a-choo-a-choo, -choo, tooth, munch, munch, nicey. Choo-a-choo-a-choo, -choo, tooth, munch, munch, nicey. As the shades of night were by this time closing in, these expressions were supposed to embody this simple people's view of the evening hymn. But it too soon appeared that the song was a translation of For What We Are Going to Receive, etc. The chief, imposingly decorated with feathers of lively colors, and having the majestic appearance of a fighting parrot, no sooner understood, he understood English perfectly, that the ship was the beauty, Captain Boldheart, than he fell upon his face on the deck, and could not be persuaded to rise until the captain had lifted him up and told him he wouldn't hurt him. All the rest of the savages also fell on their faces with marks of terror, and had also to be lifted up one by one. Thus the fame of the great bold heart had gone before him, even among these children of nature. Turtles and oysters were now produced in astonishing numbers, and on these and yams the people made a hearty meal. After dinner the chief told Captain Boldheart that there was better feeding up at the village, and that he would be glad to take him and his officers there. Apprehensive of treachery, Boldheart ordered his boat's crew to attend him completely armed, and well were it for other commanders if their precautions, but let us not anticipate. When the canoes arrived at the beach, the darkness of the night was illuminated by the light of an immense fire. Ordering his boat's crew, with the intrepid though illiterate William at their head, to keep close and be upon their guard, Boldheart bravely went on, arm in arm with the chief. But how to depict the captain's surprise! when he found a ring of savages singing in chorus that barbarous translation of For What We Are Going to Receive, etc., which has been given above, and dancing hand in hand round the Latin grammar master, in a hamper, with his head shaved, while two savages flowered him before putting him to the fire to be cooked. Boldheart now took counsel with his officers on the course to be adopted. In the meantime, the miserable captive never ceased begging pardon and imploring to be delivered. On the generous Boldheart's proposal, it was at length resolved that he should not be cooked, but should be allowed to remain raw on two conditions, namely, number one, that he should never under any circumstances presume to teach any boy anything any more. Number two, that, if taken back to England, he should pass his life in travelling to find out boys who wanted their exercises done, and should do their exercises for those boys for nothing, and never say a word about it. Drawing his sword from its sheath, Boldheart swore him to these conditions on its shining blade. The prisoner wept bitterly and appeared acutely to feel the errors of his past career. The captain then ordered his boat's crew to make ready for a volley, and after firing to reload quickly. And expect a score or two on ye to go head over heels murmured William Boozy, for I'm a-looking at ye. With those words, the derisive though deadly William took a good aim. Fire! 
the ringing voice of Boldheart was lost in the report of the guns and the screeching of the savages. Volley after volley awakened the numerous echoes. Hundreds of savages were killed, hundreds wounded, and thousands ran howling into the woods. The Latin grammar master had a spare nightcap lent him, and a long tail coat which he wore hind side before. He presented a ludicrous though pitiable appearance, and serve him right. We now find Captain Boldheart, with this rescued wretch on board, standing off for other islands. At one of these, not a cannibal island, but a pork and vegetable one, he married, only in fun on his part, the king's daughter. Here he rested some time, receiving from the natives great quantities of precious stones, gold dust, elephant's teeth, and sandalwood and getting very rich. This, too, though he almost every day made presents of enormous value to his men. The ship, being at length as full as she could hold of all sorts of valuable things, Boldheart gave orders to weigh the anchor and turn the beauty's head toward England. These orders were obeyed with three cheers, and ere the sun went down, full many a hornpipe had been danced on deck by the uncouth, though agile, William. We next find Captain Boldheart about three leagues off Madeira, surveying through his spy-glass a stranger of suspicious appearance making sail towards him. On his firing a gun ahead of her to bring her to, she ran up a flag, which he instantly recognized as the flag from the mast in the back garden at home. Inferring from this that his father had put to sea to seek his long-lost son, the captain sent his own boat on board the stranger to inquire if this was so, and if so, whether his father's intentions were strictly honorable. The boat came back with a present of greens and fresh meat, and reported that the stranger was the family of twelve hundred tons, and had not only the captain's father on board, but also his mother, with the majority of his aunts and uncles, and all his cousins. It was further reported to Boldheart that the whole of these relations had expressed themselves in a becoming manner, and were anxious to embrace him, and thank him for the glorious credit he had done them. Boldheart at once invited them to breakfast next morning on board the beauty, and gave orders for a brilliant ball that should last all day. It's in the course of the night that the captain discovered the hopelessness of reclaiming the Latin grammar master. That thankless traitor was found out as the two ships lay near each other, communicating with the family by signals and offering to give up Boldheart. He was hanged at the yard-arm the first thing in the morning, after having it impressively pointed out to him by Boldheart that this was what spiders came to. The meeting between the captain and his parents was attended with tears. His uncles and aunts would have attended their meeting with tears, too, but he wasn't going to stand that. His cousins were very much astonished by the size of his ship and the discipline of his men, and were greatly overcome by the splendor of his uniform. He kindly conducted them round the vessel, and pointed out everything worthy of notice. He also fired his hundred guns, and found it amusing to witness their alarm. The entertainment surpassed everything ever seen on board ship, and lasted from ten in the morning until seven the next morning. Only one disagreeable incident occurred. Captain Boldheart found himself obliged to put his cousin Tom in irons for being disrespectful. On the boy's promising amendment, however, 
he was humanely released after a few hours' close confinement. Boldheart now took his mother down into the great cabin and asked after the young lady with whom, it was well known to the world, he was in love. His mother replied that the object of his affections was then at school at Margate for the benefit of sea-bathing. It was the month of September. But that she feared the young lady's friends were still opposed to the union. Boldheart at once resolved, if necessary, to bombard the town. Taking the command of his ship with this intention, and putting all but fighting men on board the family, with orders to that vessel to keep in company, Boldheart soon anchored in Margate Roads. Here he went ashore, well armed, and attended by his boat's crew, at their head the faithful though ferocious William, and demanded to see the mayor, who came out of his office. "'Dost know the name of yon ship, mare?' asked Boldheart fiercely. "'No,' said the mayor, rubbing his eyes, which he could scarce believe when he saw the goodly vessel riding at anchor. "'She is named the Beauty,' said the captain. "'Ha!' exclaimed the mayor with a start. "'And you, then, are Captain Boldheart?' "'The same.' A pause ensued. The mayor trembled. "'Now, mayor,' said the captain, "'choose. Help me to my bride, or be bombarded.' The mayor begged for two hours' grace in which to make inquiries respecting the young lady. Boldheart accorded him but one, and during that one placed William Boozy sentry over him with a drawn sword and instructions to accompany him wherever he went and to run him through the body if he showed a sign of playing false. At the end of the hour the mayor reappeared more dead than alive, closely waited on by Boozy, more alive than dead. Captain, said the mayor, I have ascertained that the young lady is going to bathe. Even now she waits her turn for a machine. The tide is low, though rising. I, in one of our town boats, shall not be suspected. When she comes forth in her bathing dress into the shallow water from behind the hood of the machine, my boat shall intercept her and prevent her return. Do you the rest. Mayor, returned Captain Boldheart, thou hast saved thy town. The captain then signaled his boat to take him off, and, steering her himself, ordered her crew to row towards the bathing ground, and there to rest upon their oars. All happened as had been arranged. His lovely bride came forth, the mare glided in behind her, she became confused and had floated out of her depth when, with one skilful touch of the rudder and one quivering stroke from the boat's crew, her adoring bold heart held her in his strong arms. There her shrieks of terror were changed to cries of joy. Before the beauty could get under way, the hoisting of all the flags in the town and harbour and the ringing of all the bells announced to the brave bold heart that he had nothing to fear. He therefore determined to be married on the spot, and signalled for a clergyman and clerk, who came off promptly in a sailing boat named the Skylark. Another great entertainment was then given on board the beauty, in the midst of which the mayor was called out by a messenger. He returned with the news that government had sent down to know whether Captain Boldheart, in acknowledgment of the great services he had done his country by being a pirate, would consent to be made a lieutenant colonel. For himself he would have spurned the worthless boon, but his bride wished it, and he consented. Only one thing further happened before the good ship family was dismissed, 
with rich presents to all on board. It is painful to record, but such is human nature in some cousins, that Captain Boldheart's unmannerly cousin Tom was actually tied up to receive three dozen with a rope's end for cheekiness and making games, when Captain Boldheart's lady begged for him, and he was spared. The beauty then refitted, and the captain and his bride departed for the Indian Ocean to enjoy themselves for evermore. Of Captain Boldheart and the Latin Grammar Master by Charles Dickens Read by Linda Siano